Thank you for being here this morning, and we really appreciate um, having Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester with us this morning. As you know, she is Delaware's sole representative to the House of Rep Representatives. Um, Delaware, we are small, but we are mighty, right? Yes. Yeah. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester serves on the committee, the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. The committee has broad jurisdiction over health care, the environment, commerce and trade, energy policy, telecommunications, manufacturing, and consumer protection. Pretty much everything. <laughs> That's right. All right. Yeah. She's going to uh, provide us with a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, and then we'll open the floor for questions and answers. And uh, we're just very glad you're here. And please join me in giving a warm welcome to Lisa Blunt Rochester. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Well, good morning again, everyone. Good morning. Um, I am honored to be here. I'm honored to be with the congregation. I'm honored to be with uh, this great man of God and your entire team. Um, I see we have a rabbi, we have a minister, we have a everyone from different backgrounds, and it's just an honor to be here, especially talking about voting rights. Oh, and we have Senator Tom Carper, my mentor, my friend, um, who is an incredible representative, our senator, and chairman of the, I just talked about Give a Hoot, Don't Pollute. He is the chairman of, of Environment and Public Works. So thank you so much, Senator, for being a member, but also a friend, also a friend. Um, I will start off with some disclaimers. First disclaimer, um, Greg talked about the committee that I'm on. I'm on Energy and Commerce, and as, as uh, the Senator will tell you, it's an exclusive committee in the House. Um, the late Chairman John Dingell said, if it moves its energy, if it says still its commerce, we control everything. So <laughs> it was really important for me to get on that committee because it is the jurisdiction of health and environment and so many of the issues that affect us right here at home in Delaware. So the disclaimer, number one, I am not on judiciary, so I am not the expert at this, okay? Put that in your, your thinking, and your skull. Uh, so part of this presentation, I really was trying to do something that was not number two disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer. So this is not lawyer speak, um, but there are some incredible folks in our state that are working on this from a legal perspective, in addition to Senator Chris Coons, who actually is on the Judiciary Committee. So this will be the 101, and if you want the deep dive, you can call Chris Coons, okay? <laughs> we good? We ready? Okay. Um, and so I started off with this title, Our Vote, Our Voice, because I believe, I believe that the ability to cast a ballot makes us so special, makes our country so great. And I want us to re remember that, even as I go through this presentation, that this is about each of us having a voice in this country. So when we talk about issues of climate or criminal justice reform or any of those things, it's tied to the vote. It's tied to the vote. Our economy even is tied to our vote and justice is tied to our vote. First slide, and I'm here with Victoria from my team, so thank you, Victoria, who, who actually used to be on TC's team, so thank you, TC. All right, first slide. I just wanted to do a quick sort of where we've been, a little bit of history, so we can have some context. Um, where we are now, just the current status of voting rights in our country, and then where we're going what we must do to secure voting rights for all. So that's the kind of the, the, the gist of this. And I don't know who took this picture. I think it was Andrew. It's a lovely picture. I love it. It's like a kind of a Beyonce at the Capitol picture. <laughs> I really like that. Next picture. I mean, next slide. <laughs> and I start with this premise, this core value that every eligible voter should be able to cast their vote freely, fairly, and safely. Safely, okay, I'm making sure that was spelled correctly. Uh, freely, yes, safely. Uh, this is important because I think sometimes we get caught up in Democrats versus Republicans, red versus blue. And to me, there has to be a foundation, a thing that we all can agree on and believe in. And I think it is that 
we should be able to cast votes. There shouldn't be long lines of people trying to get to the ballot. People should be safe. The elections should be secure. And they should have integrity. So we start off with a core value. Next slide. So just from a historic perspective, I was thinking about some of the challenges that we faced as a country as it pertains to voting. Everything from exclusion to suppression to subversion to misinformation. And I start with exclusion because I, I know a lot of times we think about this present moment, but the whole goal is expanding the people who can vote. And we all know that at one point in our country, everyone did not have the right to vote. A lot of people did not have the right to vote. I'm gonna go to the next slide for a second. And I will say just in terms of those folks that did not have the right to vote, we think about people who didn't own land. We think about um, people that didn't have money, that maybe had to pay a poll tax. We think about um, the issues of whether you were Asian, whether you were black or brown, whether you were Native American, whether you were a person with disabilities, an American with disabilities, or a woman. There were times in our history where there wasn't full representation. Next slide. And in our Constitution, 1789, it grants the states the power to set voting requirements. Generally, states limited this right to property owning or tax paying white males, about 6% of the population. Again, the grounding, the foundation, the goal here is to expand people's opportunity to vote, to have a voice. Next slide. And so we know that there were amendments like the 14th, the 15th, the 17th, and the 19th that did that. That as we grew and got better and better and better, we expanded that opportunity. 1868, citizenship is guaranteed to all persons born or naturalized in the United States by the 14th Amendment, setting the stage for future expansions to voting rights. 1817, the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution prevents states from denying the right to vote on the grounds of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Now, mind you, a lot of people think of that as the amendment that allowed black folks to have the right to vote, but not necessarily women. That was men. Then we go to 1913. Direct election of senators established by the 17th Amendment gave voters, rather than the state legislatures, the right to elect senators. 1920, women are guaranteed the right to vote in all U.S. states by that amendment. And then there's the 24th Amendment. There are others that also weave through other voting rights opportunities. But again, the goal is to make the tent bigger. Next slide. And then we hear of court cases. Court cases that, some court cases that expanded, some court cases that contracted the right to vote. In 1962, courts can hear redistricting cases. In 1964, the court rules that, dis that districts in the United States House of Representatives must be approximately equal in population. And just to um, put a pin in that one, um, many of you may be following there are um, seven states that have an at-large member. So for you, my friend from Afghanistan, you might know that Delaware only has one member of the House. After this last census, now Montana will get two. And Delaware will actually represent more people in Congress than anybody. We are the largest. And even as my colleagues were debating these issues of redistricting and how it should be done and what should be put in the legislation, every single time they would say, well, that's not your problem, Lisa. You only got one. So, <laughs> 1966, tax payment and wealth requirements for voting are eliminated by the courts. Next, next slide. And then I like this quote from Chief, uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren, the right to vote freely 
for the candidate of one's choice is of essence of a democratic society. And any restrictions on that right strike at the heart of representative government. Again, everyone being able to participate and have a voice, without that you strike at the heart of representative government. Next slide. So 1965, the Voting Rights Act, protection of voter registration and voting for racial minorities is established by the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This has also been uh, applied to correcting discriminatory election systems and districting. I guess I pause here. Um, I, I shared with you, I am a child of the 60s. I was born in 1962. It's not that long ago. Like, think about it. We, we, I think we, we, we take for granted the strides that we have made and that it wasn't that long ago that some of us in this room could not even vote. That's why this is so important, regardless of what party you are. That's why this is so important. I'm so grateful. Are you not grateful for the people that came before us that marched and allowed not only for me to vote, but to even be a congresswoman? Next slide. The issue of preclearance. Now this is a term many of you may have been hearing because it's one of the big and fundamental issues that is discussed. States such as Texas, Alabama, and Mississippi use tactics such as poll taxes and tests to determine eligibility of voters. You all have heard the stories of count the number of jelly beans in a jar to be able to have the right to vote. Given their historic practices of disenfranchising voters, the Voting Rights Act required those states and other certain jurisdictions across the country to obtain preclearance. Otherwise, meaning um, before they change any voter laws or regulations around voting, they needed to get approval from the Department of Justice. This is a foundational issue, particularly as we see on the next, let's go to the next couple of slides. And there have been challenges. Uh, in 2013, the Supreme Court ruled that the requirements for determining preclearance laid out in the Voting Rights Act were invalid. This means that jurisdictions that have historically been disenfranchised um, voters introduced new restrictive laws without approval of the DOJ. And then there have been other recent court actions weakening the Voting Rights Act, which is again what has created a sense of urgency for us to revisit it, to go back and look at it, and look at it in the context of today. Next slide. I love this quote by uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg as well in her dissent. Throwing out preclearance when it has worked is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. That's, 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 a, great, that's a great quote. You don't throw away the umbrella, right? Next slide. And now we're seeing across the country um, in states different changes to voting rights. Next slide. Legislators in at least 27 states have introduced or pre-filed or carried over 250 rest uh, restrictive bills this year. Actually, and, and I, I have to say, I've heard there are up to 400, over 400 bills that are out there. Uh, last year, 19 states passed 34 laws restricting access to voting. These laws cut voting times, shuttered polling places, and purged voting rolls. So for many of us, the concern is that we not go backwards, that we not limit people's access to the polls, and that we not see, I remember um, when Nelson Mandela was freed in South Africa. And I, I, I was with a whole group of people. It was a, 
we didn't even know it was going to happen. And I remember later seeing their first election and seeing people lined up like miles to vote. I never thought I would see that in our country, that people would have to stand on line and during a pandemic. We don't want to restrict that. We want to make sure that people have the opportunity to vote. Next slide. And so this is kind of hard to see, but basically it gives you an idea that voting rights laws um, that are restrictive are in the lighter blue, um, expansive laws are in the darker, um, expansion, uh, expansive and restrictive mixed laws are the, the darkest color. In the next slide. And so part of it is that we want to make sure, and this is where some of the disconnect comes, we need to make sure that our laws, that our voting rights are protected, but also that our elections are safe and secure and that there isn't tampering. I know for myself and I know the senator, we had an opportunity even before um, the last, before the pandemic started, to see the new voting machines that were coming to Delaware and to test them out and to see how they worked. And I remember leading up to the election, we actually organized a round table with our voter, uh, voting uh, Department of Election folks, our cybersecurity folks, others, just to make sure that our, our elections here in Delaware were safe. And I remember us getting a bipartisan briefing. And it was at that time Chris Krebs, who was the former head of um, cybersecurity, US cybersecurity, he later went on to say that 2020 was the most safe and secure election of our time. Quote, there is no foreign power that is flipping votes. There's no domestic actor flipping votes. Uh, I, I did it right. We did it right. This was a secure election. So we have to maintain security. That's vital to the integrity of what we do. At the same time, we have to make sure that we protect and expand voting rights. Next slide. So where are we today? What's, what's happening today? Next slide. Some of you may say, um, have watched some of the congressional action. I put action in quotes because sometimes I think people don't think we act too much. But, <laughs> but there is some action happening. Uh, and, and, and so I wanted to share in March of last year, the House passed the For the People Act to reform and enhance voting practices. That was an incredibly massive, comprehensive bill that looked at everything. You'll see some of the other um, on the next slide. Some of the different elements that were in that are also in the Freedom to Vote Act. But we passed that last year. And then in August, we passed H.R. 4, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act in the House. In January, the Senate was able to debate the Freedom to Vote Act. It was the Freedom to Vote Act, correct, Senator? Yes. Um, it stalled in the Senate. And I remember very clearly, um, this was a real tough moment. I, I, I actually went over to the Senate and sat on a row similar to the ones that you're sitting in in the pews um, to watch the conversation and the debate about ensuring that we move forward with voting rights. And um, I was so proud of our senators. I was so proud of our senators because they each got up and gave speeches that really showed why this is important. And if you get a chance, even going on maybe YouTube or maybe on their websites to go back and listen to the words of both Senator Coons and Senator Carper, I wanted to be in that room because I felt as if, um, and this was the, the room where they were debating, do we move forward? Do we vote to change the rules so that the filibuster uh, doesn't stop us from dealing with voting rights and our democracy. And I just wanted to be there. I knew that there have been so many historic moments in these last couple of years, 
But this was on the heels of Martin Luther King's birthday. And it was just important to represent. I felt as if uh, I was representing all of Delaware sitting there listening to that debate, that historic debate. And as I said, I was proud of our senator. Next slide. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what's in some of those, so those bills. Um, for example, the John Lewis bill really is about modernizing and revitalizing that Voting Rights Act of 1965. And as I said, the House passed it, and it's awaiting uh, action in the Senate. But it was strengthen the law, moving us closer to ending discrimination in voting and guaranteeing equal access to the ballot. And we put this picture of John here because I was blessed. I mean, I'm in a church, so I can say I was blessed. Well, I'd say it if I wasn't, wasn't in a church. I'd say it anywhere. I was blessed to be able to serve with this incredible person. Did I hear an amen? Did I, did, yes, I did. I, I heard an amen. I heard an amen to John Lewis. Yes. Uh, he, to me, um, epitomized grace, civility, strength, fearlessness, even when you're afraid. I got to be on the Edmund Pettus Bridge with him twice. And I, I put this picture of John because I want us to remember and I want us to know that he passes the baton to us to get this work done. That's why we named the bill after him. Next slide. Here are some of the elements of the Freedom to Vote Act. And just to put in context, um, this Freedom to Vote Act is sort of a combination of the Senate and the House's work together. But again, expanding opportunities for voting, like making sure that um, we can have same-day voting, that there's a national holiday so that people don't have to take off work, those things that might um, diminish people's opportunities to vote. Modernizing voter registration. We in Delaware have Motor Voter, right? You can go to DMV. That is part of this as well, to give more access points. Election security, which we've already talked about. Tackling voter suppression. Reforming campaign financing. And that's an important element too, because we know that dark money is out there. And if we want to um, have those free and fair elections, people need to have transparency. You need to know, where is this money coming from? Where is it going? Campaign finance uh, reform. And also expanding the opportunity for people to run for office. I mean, we know that part of the challenge, I, I, and I can tell you personally, it's hard enough to run for office. But many people don't have a Rolodex. And, Many of us in here know what a Rolodex is, but it just, just, it just hit me. I might, that might be one of those record player moments. But, but, but many of us, Victoria, a Rolodex was a thing that was paper. And, oh, okay. Anyway, many of us don't have all of these resources that we can call to get money to raise to run for office. But there are so many incredible people out there that are serving and could serve in Congress, campaign finance reform. And then looking at the redistricting. Next slide. We had, a, we took it out, but we had this slide that had all these different gerrymandered, you know, weird configurations of states that, with their, their voting districts. And those are intentionally sometimes designed to limit the power of the people. This, and, and the senator could also speak to this, the Electoral Count Act is being talked about and reform, about reforming it. It's being talked about right now. And it's a bipartisan effort in the Senate. 
It will reform a law from the 1800s governing the way in which electoral votes are counted and ensure that no election results from an individual state could be overruled. This is really important because I remember the day of the insurrection, January 6th, and realizing that for those of us who were trapped up in that gallery, had we not gotten out, had we died, even four of us, everything could have been different. Had we not gone back and certified the election and did our duty, and that's always the uplifting part to me of that day. I heard the day that uh, the Senate was debating the um, Freedom to Vote Act, uh, Senator Warnock talked about January 5th and January 6th. And he talked about January 5th being a day of such hope that for the first time in the history, the state of Georgia, which is one of the big voting rights challenging states as we know, elected its first Jewish member from, from Georgia to Congress, to the Senate, and its first African American to the Congress, and that it was a day full of hope. But like a swing, January 6th was a day, a dark day. And he said, we swing between the fifth and the sixth. The fifth and the sixth. What day do we want to end on? What I love about this is that it gives us an opportunity in a bipartisan way to start talking about voting rights. And so I, uh, even though I, I, I'm, I'm not on the Committee of Jurisdiction and I'm not in the Senate, but over these past months, I've tried to stay connected to both our senators and I keep in contact with Chris Coons to say, what's happening on this? Where are we moving on this? Can we be ready in the House to work together to get something done before we get to the fall? This gives me some hope. Next. Where are we going? Don't you love it? Look at that. That's Delaware's president right there. That's in the Oval. I feel like Olivia Pope. Oh my gosh. So woo. Wow. That's Delaware, so exciting. Where are we going? Next slide. Protecting our elections. The, as I said, the Electoral Count, Vote, uh, Count Act is an important step, but it doesn't solve our problems. It's sort of like a after. <laughs> That's after people have stood online for 15,000 hours. No, we gotta deal with the other things as well. We have to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and reinstate preclearance policies. Next. Again, this would really fully restore the full powers and protections of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and there's more that is happening on this piece, but one of the other things that I've learned in my time in Congress is you don't have to negotiate everything in the media. I mean, Sometimes it stops people from working together. And so we have a moment right now. And for me, I remember one time during the summer just calling Stacey Abrams and saying, Stacey, what is on your must-have list, like right now? Talking to my colleagues in the, in, the, in the House and the Senate, asking what are our musts? Because we have to get this done next. Again, our goal, safe and fair elections. The vote is the great equalizer. I don't care if you are the CEO of Google or John that works at the Wawa. Your one vote is your voice. And everything is tied to that voice. So our goal should be accessible, fair, and safe elections, and making sure that everybody has the opportunity to be heard. Next slide. And what can you do? This is, the, this is the fun part. This is the drum roll part. 
Number one, you're already doing it. Get educated. I'm not even an expert in these things. There's so many complicated pieces to this. But get educated about it. Engage with elected officials and use your voice to tell us what's important to you. You do that. Get involved in organizations working to protect the vote. And what's not here, um, but I was talking to my old neighbor, Lynn Kilhorn, who is phenomenal. And I was saying, we were talking about also hearing perspectives that are not yours. Seeking to understand where somebody else is coming from and why they feel the way that they feel about it and listening. Because that's a big issue right now. We gotta hear each other. And people talk about the Congress and how is it you can be in the Congress? It's like being in a, in a family. It's the same thing. And considering how some of the families are acting these days and not talking to each other, it really is the same. We need to talk to each other. Volunteer to help administer elections. I just ran into a woman. We had a special election here in Delaware and Wilmington. And it was so beautiful to see these individuals there, sitting there, taking the information. Volunteer, help. It is part of our, our, our civic duty. And the reality is, so many of us are frustrated in this moment, or sad, or feel heavy, or feel... The way to change that is to do what you can do. You don't have to do what I do. You don't have to boil the ocean. Just do your part. When I was running, my best friend said, Lisa, I don't have money to give you, but I can make a mean pot of spaghetti. And so as I was running up and down the state, losing from all the running up and down the state, Michelle was making me stew and spaghetti. She did her part. Just do your part. Just do your part and keep voting and keep expanding, reaching out to others to vote and ultimately keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. I brought with me my scarf that many of you have seen that um, allowed my great-great-great-grandfather to have the right to vote, a former slave in Georgia. This uh, document my sister Thea turned into a scarf that I carried on the day that I was sworn in because we made history in Delaware. You made history in Delaware. We had never elected a woman to Congress. We had never elected a person of color to Congress. Kudos to Women's History Month, the little note, side note there. But we did that. And I wanted to remember, I wanted that day to be special when I was sworn in. And so we turned that document into this scarf, Returns of Qualified Voters and Reconstruction Oath from 1867. The X at the bottom is his signature. That X, because he couldn't write. I carry this as my proof of where we've been, that we've been through slavery. We've been through Reconstruction. We've been through Jim Crow, mass incarceration. And we made it. But it's also my inspiration for what is still yet to be done, that we keep our eyes on the prize I don't profess to be a voting rights expert, but I tell you what I am. I'm an American. I'm an American. And I'm proud of that. You should be proud of that. And the opportunity to have all Americans participate, have a voice, that's what this is about. That's why you should care. That's why I care. I thank you for giving me the opportunity. I thank you. I thank you. Thank you. And I think we have a couple 
a minute maybe for questions. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. That's when we, the voting rights was extended, we had to keep extending it uh, right. all the time. Right. Uh, for 25 years, so we've got another nine years or so to go. Yeah. But, um, Justice Roberts, his court has uh, gotten rid of the preclearance. So his thoughts are right. that America is just not as racist right. as we believed it to be, and that's why we don't need right. preclearance. Right. When that was uh, extended in 2006, the vote was not only bipartisan, it was unanimous. It was That's 98 correct. to zero. That's correct. To approve this. That's correct. I don't understand why anyone who is an American citizen and over 18 years old right. and can prove that can't walk in and vote. Right, right. Why are we having this problem? Why first do of people all, want people not to vote? First of all, I love that you brought up a couple of things. Number one, the thinking about, first of all, the reason why we also need to look at preclearance again um, is because it, we used to focus on those southern states and the ones that it was so, so overt, but we've seen things in northern states and that's why it's so important to have it. I think your point as well about this was a bipartisan issue. This used to be a bipartisan issue. And, you know, I go back to the family conversation about um, us being divided. Um, why I was focused on those areas where first finding where we can have some common ground and get some movement and then add on to that is because I don't want us to stay stuck and this is too important. Um, your, your point, there are, there, are, there are a couple things that I could think of that used to be bipartisan. And that's why I made the admonition that it really does begin with each of us. I, 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 I'm trying to do my part where I am to spread that um, idea that, that we're in this together. Um, but I can't, I can't speak for those folks that before it was, they, they believed in it and now they don't. I just know that I'm going to keep my eyes on the prize and I'm not going to stop. Um, and I feel that there are folks that feel that same way. My concern about just focusing on the ECA is that that isn't enough. Um, I will share also that um, I'm part of a group that is working on how do we deal with, like, to me, there are a lot of great things, but what has to come first? To me, preclearance is one of those things that has to come first. Because that, and, 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 and to me, I don't think preclearance should be limited to those states. I think it should be national. I think that if we're going to try to tamper or change or alter voting rights, then the DOJ might need to take a look at it. And I don't care if you're in the north, the south, the east, or the west. Now, like I said, I'm not a lawyer, but I do know that there is conversation to look at, at that as well. Um, but you know, people will ask me, what keeps me going? Um, why, 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 can, why am I still smiling after five years of Congress? Um, <laughs> and I think part of it is, well, no, not part. My faith, my faith keeps me going. You know, the, 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 what is it? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I keep going because I believe there's something bigger than a couple of senators or, you know, or, you know, or hate. 
I do what I do for love. And many of you know, I ran after the unexpected death of my husband at age 52. A vegetarian who worked out every day, who was humble, smart, kind, funny, brilliant, played a game of basketball before uh, a meeting and ruptured his Achilles tendon and blood clots went to his heart and lungs and he died. And that whole year I was very sad and very mad like a lot of people in our country. And it wasn't until a year later seeing a dad with three kids in front of me in the supermarket putting back grapes because they were $9 that I realized I'm okay. I'm going to be okay. But a lot of people are hurting. This moment, a lot of people are hurting. And as bad as that was, Charles set everything up before he left. And I was able to do this, to run. My daughter said I picked my lowest low to reach for the highest height. Thank you, Amen Corner. <laughs> and even when I was trapped in that gallery during the insurrection, and we were ducking and climbing over things, and it was nothing but the grace of God that it was even put on my spirit to pray. Because I saw my colleagues on the ground FaceTiming family members, saying goodbye, and I just knew and somebody transcribed what I said, that all things work together for the good, for, for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. You are called for such a time as this. And even the bad exposes us, it lets us see who we really are. So believe that even in this dark moment, if you feel down, Lift somebody else up. Love yourself. That's what, that's what God told me on Charles' deathbed when I asked, why are we here even? It's to love. It's basic. So don't get so caught up and so rigid, whether it's in your position. We're here to love. And I know Victoria's looking at her watch because my dad's 79th birthday party is in a minute but I want you to absorb that. When you love someone, you want to see them safe, not in a country where they're at risk. When you love someone, you want them to be able to have clean drinking water, which is why I fight for that and bring that to Delaware. When you love someone, you don't want to see them calling your town murder town. Just love. Love the people who are unlovable. That's what we're called to do. It's easy to love who you love. It's hard to love who you don't like. That's hard. Believe you me, I know it personally. <laughs> love. That's it. That's why this is important. Love. That's all I want you to remember. Love each other and love yourselves. Love the planet and love God. That's it. Thank you, guys. Lisa, we really appreciate you being with us today, and we, I especially appreciate that you quit speaking and started preaching. <laughs> <laughs> and you have no idea how difficult it is to get an amen in a Presbyterian sanctuary. <laughs> Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah.